sunny day in July 1977, Aaron Neely was water skiing with Ed Fletcher and his daughter in Canada's Lake Okanagan. As shown in this reenactment, Aaron was an expert and had skied these waters many times. Neither Ed nor his daughter was alarmed when Aaron took a spill, but they were when she started screaming. Safely in the boat, young Aaron told a terrifying story of coming face to face with a huge serpent-like monster. was not the first person to see such a creature in Lake Okanagan, nor the last. a long creature about two feet wide and about 40 feet in length was on the top of the water. And it was just incredible the way it moved. His head seemed to be uh, the shape of a snake. Eyewitnesses claim that a monster rises from the depths and surfaces unexpectedly. They call him Ogopogo. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Many believe that a mysterious monster lives in the depths of Loch Ness in Scotland. This ancient ruin marks the spot where St. Columba first sighted the creature in 565 AD. Loch Ness, however, is not the only place where forbidding monsters are reported to dwell. In British Columbia, Lake Okanagan is reputed to be the home of a giant water creature similar to the one in Loch Ness. Both lakes are remarkably alike, lying at almost the same latitude. Both are long and narrow, having areas of great depth. Both were formed by cataclysmic shifts of the Earth's crust. They have similar temperatures, and contain almost identical types of fish. This is a famous picture claimed to be of the Loch Ness Monster. The head bears a striking resemblance to that of a prehistoric creature. Reports of beasts of immense length indicate that creatures like these may still exist. But how could it be possible for them to survive undetected for millions of years? If such creatures unknown to science do indeed exist, what could they be? Fish, mammal, reptile, or some species long thought to be extinct? Forty years ago, the scientific world was stunned by the discovery of a coelacanth, a fish believed to have been extinct for 60 million years. Not only was it very much alive, but many times larger than any of its ancestors. If such a discovery happened once, could it not happen again? On the surface, Lake Okanagan presents a scene of calm beauty, but this view can change in a moment. Winds rise seemingly from nowhere, whipping the lake into a fury. Can it be that below this changeable surface dwells a creature rivaling the famous Loch Ness Monster? The Okanagan Indians have lived near the shores of the lake for centuries, long before the white man. Like all Indians, they hold a deep reverence for nature, believing that all of creation is part of the plan of the Great Spirit. The Indians of Okanagan both respect and fear their lake. Many of their legends are built around it. 
These legends are passed down around the campfires from generation to generation. You know, like in, and this lake is like a living, a living, sacred thing. In an hour or two hours, this lake can be a raging, raging body of water and very dangerous. In this lake, we have the Nchachait, it's a serpent that lives in the water and has been told to me by my great, great grandfather and told to him by his ancestors. In early times, according to legend, no Indian would attempt to cross Lake Okanagan without first offering a small animal to the lake monster. There are stories of those who failed to make such offerings and whose horses were sucked under by a mysterious force. Stories of canoes wrecked and scattered on the rocks. The Indian's offering can be viewed as a spiritual act of sacrifice or as the pragmatic act of appeasing a hungry monster. <laughs> At the Kelowna Museum near Lake Okanagan, we talked with curator Ursula Surtees, who has devoted years to the study of the local Indian culture. Nahartik lived about midway down Okanagan Lake in a little cabin underneath Squally Point. And Ogopogo, or Nahartik, was a creature that had to be appeased whenever the occasion arose. Many people have cast some doubts as to whether Ogopogo was really there, but the Indian people have for years known about Ogopogo, and we have learned over a long period of time that Indian legends, for the most part, have a very substantial amount of fact and truth in them. Mary Moon is the author of Ogopogo, the Okanagan Mystery. I first came up into this lake country in 1972 as assistant editor of a magazine to write seven or eight stories about this area. And everywhere I went up and down the valley, um, they kept saying this funny word, Ogopogo, Ogopogo. And I said, what's an Ogopogo? And they said, oh, the snake in the lake. And I said, what? They said, oh, the snake in the lake. And I said, please tell me about it. And they rounded up half a dozen people, seven or eight people, of stunning respectability and uh, great enthusiasm and great sincerity. And they told me their stories, and they all hung together. We launched our boat at Peachland. Harry and Betty Staines have often cruised these waters. About one third of the way across, we noticed a commotion in the water to our right. And we turned our boat in that direction. When we got near this area, we noticed this huge creature emerged from the water and was swimming in a northerly direction. When I looked at it, I was just scared to death. It, it looked so huge. And I remember in particular the, uh, the fins on the top of it, the, the bone structures. You know, it was just so, uh, really stood out, the white bone structure. And I said, oh, it's got fins, you know. And I, and I, I said, Harry, let's not go any closer. It uh, just may tip the boat over. It was, it was so big. We've been holidaying in this area for the past 30 years with our family. We've heard of Ogopogo but we never believed in it. But uh, Betty and I are real believers now that there's a huge creature in this lake. Jeffrey Sherwin remembers. It was a calm day, just like it is today. We were fishing on the lake, my son David, myself, and his two friends. Parallel to the shore, we were trolling when uh, one of the boys shouted, look at that funny looking wave. I turned and uh, looked at the strangest looking thing I'd ever seen in my life. I saw two humps uh, sticking out of the water, heading for shore, uh, they, uh, we watched it for a full three minutes as the object, whatever it was, reached the shore. It was five feet short of the shore. I expected to see it walk up out of the water when the whole thing sank. I don't know what it was, but I, I think I saw Ogopogo. Uh, I've been ridiculed about this many times since, 
But I'll tell you right now, there's no way that I'd make a liar out of my son and his friends. The first time Ed Fletcher and his daughter, Jill. Uh, Jill and I were idling out in the bay there, and we were all about two blocks from, from the shore, and uh, all of a sudden this huge mound came up in front of us. And we shut the boat off, and by the time that the boat had stopped, we had almost coasted up to uh, within reaching distance of it. And that particular day, we chased Ogopogo for about an hour and a half, and out of an hour and a half, we got five pitchers. We saw just around 50 feet out, just one hump. There was just one hump there. I guess it would have been uh, around three feet high, and it was dark. And one of the reasons we believe that we've seen it so many times is because of the boat. The boat has uh, an electrical current developed by the motor going through into the rudder. And this creates what they call electrolysis. And electrolysis is a high amperage which attracts marine life. And the first year that we went out, we thought we were chasing Ogopogo, but we find that Ogopogo's attracted to the boat and it's following us. We've seen Ogopogo 40 or 50 times. At first glance, Ed Fletcher's pictures look like a wave. But a closer look reveals something much more difficult to explain. Intrigued by Ed Fletcher's pictures, our camera team decided to explore beneath the surface of Lake Okanagan in search of the Ogopogo monster. Cal Bevan, in red scuba gear, is a local diver who's made many attempts to find the monster. He agreed to try again. Our cameraman is Barry Heron, an expert underwater photographer. As the lake is over 80 miles long, his chance of filming the monster is slim. Yeah. They decided to dive in the area where Ed Fletcher stated he had sighted Ogopogo many times. It was near this spot that young Aaron Neely reported a face-to-face -face confrontation with the monster. The heavy underwater camera and housing becomes buoyant and easy to handle below the surface. Strangely, no fish were found in an area where they are known to feed. And after a long and careful search, no monster. At least, none in this section of the lake. Hoping for new information, a public meeting was announced through the local press. We were amazed by the number of people who related unusual sightings. How many people have, have seen Ogopogo here? How many people in this crowd have seen? Hold your hand up. Good. It was a hot summer morning, and the lake was just like a mirror. And uh, when my mother and I saw it, it was between uh, Trout Creek Point and Summerland. And the, this head came up out of the water like a huge horse's head. And uh, the back of, the, of, the, of it was quite calm. The lake was still there. Then its head went down, and the back of it just lashed like this. And I would estimate it would be about 35 feet long. And the whole thing I seen, head and all. And boy, he all at once, he went down. He see, must have seen me, went down and the waves all. Another guy by the name of Ed, he's not here anymore. He's in Prince George. He stopped behind me. And he says, what did you see? I just seen the Ogopogo. 
And all at once he says, gee, look at the waves in there. I says, yeah, I just seen Ogopogo, the whole thing, I says. <laughs> he didn't believe me. He says, but, oh, it's true. It must be true then. So we says, let's go to the Willow Inn for coffee. And I went, we went down the Willow Inn and told everybody, you're crazy, you're crazy. What have you been drinking? I says, nothing. <laughs> I says, I just seen Ogopogo. They didn't believe me, eh? Obviously, these people had seen something. But moving images reflected in the water can be deceiving. Well, I, I grow grapes across the lake, and I was sitting on my tractor cultivating my vineyard, and uh, I looked down in the water, and there was a big black, looked like a big black log about 50 or 60 feet long. So I stopped the tractor, and I thought, well, maybe I should go down there and cut that up because I'm looking for some cedar posts. <laughs> a few minutes later, some little waves started coming from my log, and I thought, well, uh, that thing must be alive. And suddenly, it, it started up, made a huge circle, and a terrific lashing of water, and then two uh, coils came out of the water about four or five feet high, and they were the most beautiful green you have ever seen. We were uh, part of a large group on a family picnic sort of thing in the summertime, and about six o'clock in the evening, the water was all quiet and calm, much as it is right now, and all of a sudden it started to churn. Yes, it was definitely something uh serpentine about this creature. It, it made its own wake behind it. Waves from passing boats often take five minutes to reach the shore. Could such waves appear to be large humps moving through the water? They had three humps and it looked like the uh, shadow of a tail at the back. One day, our crew was the victim of a hoax. Someone with a sense of humor tied three tires together. For a moment, the In Search of camera team thought they'd seen Ogopogo. Even allowing for optical illusions, there's much that is difficult to explain away in the many sightings. One thing is certain, the sincerity of the people interviewed. Ed Fletcher, for example, has spent a great deal of time and money continuing his own investigation. Do I understand that you saw a creature in the lake that had texture, something like the skin of the shark that's swimming past here? Yes, very much similar, sort of very smooth and shiny. No scales? No, it, uh, very similar to the shark and very similar to a whale's skin. Uh, uh, have you seen sharks and whales up close? Oh, yes, I have. In an attempt to identify what he had seen, Ed met with Willard Bascom, director of the Southern California Coastal Waters Research Project. Beside the tanks at a nearby museum, Fletcher compared the monster he had seen with some of the aquarium's underwater creatures. Oh no, it swam this way. Side, side to side. Yeah. This creature we saw was, it didn't have fins. It, it, when it was swimming, it would show mounds in the water only because of the way it was swimming like a snake. Ed learned that whales are capable of withstanding sudden and extreme changes of depths and pressures. But whales are saltwater mammals, not likely to be found in a mountain lake. Some believe Ogopogo to be a giant eel. Eels are known to grow to lengths of 20 feet, and they do inhabit freshwater lakes. One theory states that eunuch eels, with little or no sex drive, do not participate in the mating migration, but remain feeding on the bottom of lakes and grow to enormous size. Could Ogopogo be one of these? As their first attempt was inconclusive, our divers decide to try again. This time, off Squally Point, where Indian legends tell of the cave-like home of the lake monster. As the divers descended, the water grew painfully cold. Amid the rocks, our divers found many cavernous openings, but no signs of Ogopogo living in any of them. Unable to capture the monster on film, our searchers had one more contact to make the authoress of Beneath the Depths, Arlene Gall, who owns the only known motion picture footage reputed to be of Ogopogo. The most conclusive evidence that I personally feel that we have on the Ogopogo is the folded film 
The fold and film actually shows a large animate object surfacing, submerging, and propelling itself through the waters at a very high speed. There is very little doubt in my mind that there is a creature or creatures of massive size beneath the depths of Okanagan Lake. We optically enlarged the film, and on close examination, there was indeed a large object moving through the water, as shown by the white foam. Professor Willard Bascom comments on the conditions necessary for the development of a monster. One of the difficult problems is this is in a fairly small lake, which is only 90 miles long and two or three miles wide, and it just doesn't seem likely that you could have developed any animal quite so large in the relatively short time available since that lake was frozen solid during the ice ages. It just seems very unlikely to me. Uh, I do believe that in the open ocean there's probably lots of very large animals that are so rarely seen by man, sea monsters if you will, uh, animals of a certain kind which are much larger than any others like that that have ever been seen. All animals have certain problems of getting oxygen and of feeding and of living through the winter time and of mating and raising young and all the other things. And all of those things still need to be described about this particular creature, whatever it may be. But there's no question there are very large animals in the sea, which are only rarely seen. So anything might be a sea monster if it grew to a very unusual size. The persistent question remains. What is it so many reliable witnesses say they've seen in the lake? Could so many people be wrong? Whether the creature is something known or unknown, it's difficult to ignore these pictures and the large number of sightings of a creature scientists cannot explain. What it is, we still don't know. Perhaps someday, a scientific expedition will tell us. In the meantime, the fold in film provides us with the most conclusive evidence that something very large lives in Lake Okanagan. <laughs>